Nothing contained in this video cast is intended to encourage the use of illegal substances. This video cast represents only the opinions of the hosts and their guests and should not be taken as medical or legal advice. In no way does listening, reading, corresponding, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor patient or legal relationship. The content here is intended to share thoughts and opinions to foster constructive discussion. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions concerning cannabis. The views expressed by hosts and guests on this video cast are not necessarily the views of Global Cannabis Times or any other company with which the hosts and guests are associated. Welcome to another episode of Going Global, a Global Cannabis Times video cast that looks to act as the eyes and ears on the ground in emerging worldwide cannabis uh, markets. I'm Jim Mickis. I'm, I'm an attorney at Zuber Lawler, uh, a national uh, cannabis law firm. I'm here today with Stephanie Powell from Emerald Lane Recruitment, a global cannabis recruitment organization staffing the global cannabis supply chain. Point of personal note here, I, I got to really familiarize myself with Stephanie over, over LinkedIn with uh, her videos of uh, everywhere she's at in the world. Uh, it's usually somewhere new, so I'm really excited to talk to Stephanie today. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Jim. And uh, and yeah, it's uh, it's been fun to, to do some video series. I forget that I do these videos on LinkedIn. I've been doing them for almost three years now, these Tip Tuesdays. So people come up to me just like you did. And they're like, I watched your videos. And I'm like, oh yeah, I make videos for the internet. So it's uh, <laughs> as an introvert and the like only child who grew up, you know, I, I, I um, spend a lot of time by myself, but uh, I, I love connecting to the industry. It clearly resonates and it's been a lot of fun. So I also appreciate you uh, coming up to me and saying hi at Benzinga and uh, for following along. Absolutely. So uh, uh, I always say the introverts make the best extroverts, though. So I would never have picked up on that uh, at all uh, based upon your video. So they always uh, they always put a smile on my face. And I I, I think you you put on a, a great uh, uh, impression for the industry. So uh, for what it's worth. So thank you for being here today. So what I'd like to start out with is basically, you know, how tell us a little bit about your cannabis journey and how how you ended up in cannabis and how you ended up in cannabis recruitment, uh, just to get us started. Yeah. So my story is a bit of a unique one. Obviously all of us live our own lives. So we think that it's not that weird or unique, but then we tell people we're like, Oh yeah, I guess this is kind of a little bit different. So, um, like many recruiters, I fell into recruiting. So I'll start prefacing with that. But, uh, my cannabis journey was a little bit unique. So my background, I came out of school, I was in public health and health promotion. I thought I wanted to get into government work. So I started working for, um, you know, the federal government in Canada, where I was from, I started doing a lot of policy development and then I moved into healthcare and, and cannabis, uh, at kind of like was something that was something I didn't know a lot about. Um, but we, I was getting approached by pharma a lot. I was working in cancer management, cancer research, um, and really looking at how those resources are being spent by our government and really disenchanted by the pharmaceutical model I was seeing. Um, so life ended up taking me out of the government. I didn't know where I was going. I was on a bit of an eat, pray, love life journey, uh, living in Costa Rica. <laughs> and a friend came to visit and uh, I knew she spent some time in California. I knew she was there, you know, spending some time. And I asked her what she did. And she told me that she lived on a cannabis farm. And at the time I, I didn't understand or didn't know anything about it. So she sort of explained what life was like. And, and I, it was just so foreign to me. I was from a city I'd never even gone camping before. And I was in my early thirties. So this was not, you know, I wasn't young at this point. And so long story short, she told me how the farm was. I was like, that sounds nice. You know, not, not for me. Uh, and a few months later, I was going through another breakup and didn't know where I was going to go and didn't know what, where I was going to be in Costa Rica. And I ended up in the same town as her and agreed to go live on the farm. So actually eight years ago this month, uh, is my anniversary where I got put in the back of a truck in San Francisco and taken up to Northern California and Humboldt County into the Hills. So, um, all, all on my own, you know, I, I went on my own accord, but, uh, it definitely was, uh, an eye-opening opening journey and spending the next two years, I actually was on the farm and really get to understand cannabis, got to understand the plant, really spend my days with the plant um, and really get to know the Northern California sort of community. So that was how I got into cannabis. And then how I fell into recruiting was I was back in Canada in 2018. Um, again, the markets had kind of changed in California. Our farms were sold. Uh, the startup I was running in Bali, my business partner and I had a falling out. It's like, where am I going to go? There's nowhere to go. And Canada was about to legalize for adult use. So right place, right time. Uh, there was a conference at the infamous Lyft and Co. It was 2018. 18, six months before legalization. And this is when Canada had billions of dollars. So you can imagine the hype in this conference room. Oh, yeah. I walked in the room and the minds and the energy and just the drive and the excitement. I was like, I gotta be a part of that. So um, right place, right time, met someone running a recruiting firm, got talking to her. A year later, she offered me the opportunity to join her team as a recruiter. Again, I'd never recruited. I didn't know anything about it, but I said, sure, why not? And now year six, here I am. 
That's fantastic. Uh, I love uh, how you started with your your fingers in the dirt, essentially, with the plant. Uh, it, it gives you tremendous credibility in my book. That's that's great uh, to kind of learn it that way. Uh, learn the literally learn the business from the ground up. So uh, on your re your recruitment journey uh, since 2018, how have you seen it evolve uh, over the years? Because obviously very dynamic, lots of changes, legal changes all across the globe. So uh, what have, have you seen it evolve? Yeah, well, it's been an evolution. And I mean, we joke about cannabis years, right? Dog years. I say it's 10 to 1. So I'm pretty sure I'm getting to my elder years now. But uh, but no, the industry, when I joined it, right, that's when the industry in Canada at least had again, billions of dollars. It was pre-COVID. It was, everyone was going to be, you know, smoking cannabis, everyone around the world. It was just going to, everyone was going to open all the markets were going to be free. And so there was this ability for my team and I, and like I was working under someone, she had been a very early mover in the recruitment and HR space in Canada in cannabis. So she'd already had a few years of traction under her belt. So she had a lot of recognition in the community uh, and within the industry. And so when I came to it, you know, the companies had a lot of money. There wasn't a lot of groups doing it. And my, you know, our founder had a lot of uh, credibility. So we were really ahead of the races. And so we just went right in and started sprinting. And so clients would hire us for 10, 20, 30, 40 roles at a time. Like money wasn't necessarily a consideration at that point. It was, but it wasn't, you know, the, the limiting factor. And so we were able to come in and really build it all. We also were building it, not knowing where we were going, right? Like we were building these org charts and these, these teams as big as we can go, scale, scale, scale. And it was just like this consistent sort of like growth, growth, growth. And then boom, you know, nine months later, COVID hit. And so all the events, all the openings, all the traveling, all the everything just stopped. And in Canada, we had incredibly restrictive lockdowns for almost three years in some places. And so it really impacted the industry. And in some ways, it actually was positive. And again, without going too much in the politics and sort of the Canadian journey, but our retail stores were deemed essential services. So we had the only thing you could access for almost three years was grocery stores, pharmacies, and cannabis stores and liquor stores. And so, of course, that's going to skew the data in terms of like how much cannabis was being consumed and how many stores. And at one point in Ontario, in the province I'm from, which we have, I think, 17, 18 million people, we had up to 1,800 dispensaries, legal dispensaries. So it was this crazy like rise and fall. And so that's where we started from. And then as the industry has evolved, you know, in Canada, we have a mature market that's figured itself out. Obviously, we're not hiring at such a pace. Um, you know, companies are a little more strategic. They're a little bit more leaner. And then I think when we're looking at these new markets, because we also started recruiting in Europe during that time. So four years ago, I started recruiting in Switzerland, Portugal. Um, we we're doing roles in the UK. We were doing roles across all these different markets, Denmark, just trying to like learn different markets. And so we've been able to kind of watch that go. And, and the European market's been a really slow build as well. And then now with the US, you know, you have your more mature markets, you have your emerging markets, you have this sudden stop start dance that everybody's kind of doing with, you know, rescheduling, descheduling, legalization, what's happening when it's coming. So I really think the industry is still in this real influx. Um, but, you know, and we don't have the billions of dollars. So it really is a different time for the industry. But at the same time, the thing I love about this industry is the reason why we're all in it is because most of us saw the world that could be different and we want to build that. So we're building it, right? Um, and our, our name, Emerald Lane Recruitment, is a bit of a play on, on the Wizard of Oz and the Yellow Brick Road. And in that movie, you know, Dorothy's trying to get to the Emerald City because that's like utopia. So like we're all building this Emerald City that we're trying to envision, right? And so being creative and adapting our services, adapting to the industry. You know, we all are pivoting together and as service providers, it's our job to pivot as well. And I think that's really where there can be a lot of agility right now and a lot of opportunity to say like, hey, how can we meet the industry where they're at and not try to pull this like 2018 model into the future? Gotcha. Wow. So uh, you really, you kind of have your finger on the pulse of global normalization. You're kind of seeing it in process, which is... I mean, a, a big reason why I was excited to have you on on, on this uh, on this video cast. So, across the markets that you've been to, uh, uh, what are some of the interesting differences as you navigate all these different countries that are gradually uh, opening up to cannabis? Another really good question. So the differences have really been, you know, in between the concept around medical, what what constitutes medical, adult use, and then the global supply chain. So if you look at medical within the North American supply chain, you know, medical products were either sold via e-commerce or or by 
uh, joining in Canada, you could join some of the medical groups, which were a lot of the big pub co's had them. And um, you would get your medicine dispensed, to, sent to your house. Um, you know, in the U.S., there's a lot of dispensary models as well. Um, but in Europe, you know, it's it's literally medicine. It is you know, you get a, you get a prescription from your doctor, you go to a clinic or you go to a pharmacy and the pharmacist gives you your product. And so it's, it's seen differently. It's regulated different. There's different quality standards because it has to have follow the same quality standards as, as all other medicine, where in Canada and the U.S., you know, the quality standards don't change because it's a medicine. And so there's this interesting sort of dance that we're all doing within the medical differences. I think that's a, one of the major differences. Um, the other thing, obviously, is adult use. You know, there's a adult use market in, you know, the, the more mature U.S. markets. It's only coming online with the different states. Canada, we obviously have a federal framework as well, but there's not really any other model for adult use. And we're slowly seeing the European models uh, and European countries start to dip their toe in for adult use. You know, there's been a lot of hype about oh, Germany legalized. Well, you know, if, right now, if I was to fly to Germany and try to go find a dispensary, there's no dispensaries. Even if I lived there, I didn't have access to, to sort of like adult use cannabis. Right. Yes, it's it's, it's decriminalized and uh, it's open the medical channels. But we're slowly seeing this very slow. And I would say slow, like five to 10 year pilot projects like this is like turtle paste, you know. Um, we already have the, the coffee shop projects going in Amsterdam, Switzerland. Um, they've been doing their pilot project, I think, for like a year, year and a half. Germany is soon to follow. So there are these small hopes of moving into more of an adult use uh, rec sort of dispensary model, but that's going to be a real ways off for a lot of those markets. So that's a lot of the differences. And then global supply chain, right? This year alone, we've worked with clients across four continents. Um, we did an amazing, exciting head grower role in South Africa with one of our clients there. I'm working with a group right now with a facility in Colombia. Like we're really looking at the globalization across the supply chain. And so again, how do companies, how do these different areas fit into the supply chain? You know, if we're grow, building a million square foot indoor facility in an area where there's high wage costs, um, there's high cost of electricity and power and all of the um, different utilities to actually run the facility versus some of these places where it's sunshine, you know, almost 300 plus days a year. They're already in agriculture. There's already massive greenhouses and, and agricultural knowledge and, and rich soil. It's like, why would we not use those places to, to grow and cultivate a plant? So there's a lot of that globalization. So those are sort of the three trends I see and each market still trying to figure itself out and figure out how it fits together and then as, as a whole. Do you think uh, reschedule, they're, they're kind of looking to the US to, to reschedule uh, before it really opens up in Europe or... You know, what, what do you think will be the catalyst? Oof, I have some deep feelings about this, but uh, I have to think about how much I want to say. Um, no, I, I think in the U.S., obviously, there's a lot of politics at play, like a lot of lobbying. My background's in pharma. I saw how breast cancer research got funded. I saw who funded it. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, of hands in the cookie jar that that don't want cannabis to be out there. Um, and a lot of these plant medicines for for various reasons. So um, there's in, in not even necessarily these these uh, controlled plants, medicines, but ginger and, and ginseng and like some of these really ancient herbs and roots that the, the earth has been using and the plants that have healed people for years. So there's a deeper conversation. I think you know, and I, there's debates on both sides for descheduling and rescheduling. And obviously I, I can hear both sides all the time and, and, and understand from both perspectives for, for me. And from working in these regulated markets, the one thing I'm excited about for the U S is to have a quality standard and a quality framework. Like at the end of the day, this is a product that we're inhaling. We're, we're, we're eating, we are putting in our bodies, we're putting in our family's bodies, our children's bodies. If we have children who are taking this medicine with our, in our parents' bodies, if we have elders or our friends, you know, we want to know that there's clean products, you know, food follows a specific standard in, in the world, right? If you want to eat the food you eat, you trust that there's a standard that's been followed for the ingredients and how it's been processed and kept and stuff. So why would you not want that for something else that you're consuming? So for me, I think a federal framework in the US that really focused on quality, Canada did that, Health Canada, which is like the FDA in Canada, that's who regulates cannabis. They created a quality framework. They use GPP. So we did not use GMP, but we use a different type of uh, good production practices. A lot of the facilities follow GMP because they export, they follow GACP because they're going to be cultivating. So there's there's different quality frameworks and there's a reason why they exist. And that resistance to creating quality standards, I think, creates this fractioning where those of us who really want the product to get to the people in a good way, you know, we should be advocating for clean, quality, um, properly tested products because it's still being consumed at the end of the day. No doubt. I agree with you wholeheartedly. So do you, do you see GMP as kind of the, the future standard that uh, all operators will need to follow? 
tricky. So again, I'm not the qualities, but I'm working on a few quality roles right now. Yeah. So I get to like learn by osmosis, but, you know, understanding the, the process. So, you know, in, in these medical markets, cultivated flower has to follow GACP. Um, so a, a, a facility that fo- that grows follows GACP. And then once it gets to post-harvest and all the post-harvest processing and packaging, that's where the GMP standard and the GMP certified areas and processes have to be followed in order for it to be G- GMP. Um, and so to say that all cannabis should be GMP like doesn't necessarily make sense because it depends what part of the supply chain you're in. Um, but I think a lot of the processing might go in that way. I've also been privy to some amazing conversations with people that are true specialists in this area. And they talk about how GMP isn't the best quality standard for a cannabis plant, because unlike APIs for a pharmaceutical product, that's a, you know, a different chemical ingredient that's easy to measure and, and repeat. A plant isn't always easy to repeat. So a lot of companies get caught up in, um, be not being able to sort of duplicate because the plant has its own mind, even if it's, you know, different genetics or different um, THC content. So I think that GMP, and there's a, there's a general agreement that I've heard that GMP is not the best standard for the cannabis plant, but right now we don't have another option really that can qualify. So there's sort of like this, well, we'll just put it here because we don't know where else it fits. And there are some amazing groups that are really out there lobbying and advocating for different quality standards for cannabis. If you're interested in that or people are interested, there's definitely a lot of groups to, to go and check out and, and use your voice because there's a lot of voices that need to be used in these regulatory bodies to really get this this word out so what i'm hearing and what i'm hearing a lot in what you're saying is it's a very dynamic uh, situation and environment including uh obviously it's dynamic for the hiring process and uh, so how does a company uh, a cannabis company in this dynamic environment create a sustainable workforce uh, uh under these conditions it is tricky, right? It's, it's one of the challenges is how do you control the people part, right? And, and I always say the cannabis industry is built on sort of this triad and foundation and the companies that can figure it out. And once we as an industry figure it out, will be solid. But, you know, I always talk about people, profits and plants, right? And all three have to be a very solid base in order to actually create a foundation to sort of build upon. And so um, we see the, the, the how do we grow the plant? What products are we making? So that is a lot of dynamic side there. There's a lot of, you know, how are the profits going? And then you have the people part. And so what I've seen be successful over the years and sort of two sides of that. What I tell my candidates, so for anyone working in cannabis, one of the things I say very honestly to people is, you know, once you have a a career in cannabis, you will always have a career in cannabis. You just might not have the same job in cannabis. And that might mean company, that might mean area of the supply chain. There's just, you know, there's a lot of shifting, a lot of changing. And so if you can come into the industry for coming from the outside or exist in the industry, knowing that your job probably won't be the same for longer than one or two years, maybe three, maybe four, but you know, there's, there is going to be some shifts and changes, but if you keep leaning into the cannabis space and just focus on going really like specific into it, there'll always be a career for you. Um, and then on the company side of things, you know, how we've seen them really, really navigate is the companies that seem to have gotten it well. And again, in Canada, we have six years plus of data of of some of the companies and I've seen some of them you know, one is companies that stayed really niche. They knew what they wanted to do. They went in one direction and they stayed focused there. And the people that wanted to be part of that came into it. You know, two is also creating like a culture and really making sure that there is sort of embedded leadership, supportive leadership. You're all working towards common good. You're all getting buy-in from the ground up. You're incorporating your people, treating them like people, paying them fairly, like some of the basics, but they seem to get skipped a lot here. And then the other side of that is also be strategic with how you hire. Like ultimately we're all startups. Like every company in this whole industry is startups. Yes, there's some established companies that have opened sort of a cannabis vertical or cannabis arm, but we're all still startups. And so you know, being able to to slowly build and build in people that have very dynamic skill sets that and very sort of hard driven attitudes that'll that'll roll up their sleeves and kind of get to work. And so all of you can come together and really, really balance each other out and bring that multiple skill set and then strategically bring in like the people that you need as you need them so that you're building it as you grow, not building it to grow when you don't know where you're going. So it's that strategic sort of piece by piece. um, That's also been a real strategy. And then the whole team can kind of cohesively grow together. Fantastic. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And also, uh, I guess currently, what uh, what are you hiring the most for? I know that you you go from growers to executive leadership and everywhere in between. Uh, what what's hot right now? Uh, oh yeah. Well, it depends again what market I'm in. It's really exciting, and it's also seasonal. I was laughing with yeah. someone because I think I have 
four or five quality assurance roles on my desk right now. And I'm like, God, it's quality season. Like it's always this time of year. It's the quality yeah. trend. So um, I am working on a lot of quality assurance right, roles right now for uh, various global groups in, in Canada as well. Um, head growers are also something that, you know, I've been working on a lot on this year. We've done some big placements in some of the new exciting markets. Um, it's really great doing a lot of global movements. So moving people between countries and continents. And that's been always a, a lot of fun. Um, I did an R&D role this year, which was also a really exciting one. The person just got started um, this week. And so that was a really exciting dynamic role. Again, looking at product development, how do we bring in specialists who can actually help new markets to adapt and build their product and ski portfolio as, you know, 2.0 and, and more of the manufactured products come online. Um, and then a lot of executives, right? A lot of leadership. Uh, we have some exciting roles that are in, we're in sort of final signing stage for, um, and really looking at how we bring leaders into this industry. You know, our industry is, is new, we're young, we're dynamic, and you can take that in whatever sort of model you want to look at for young. Um, but we are still toddlers. We're all still very young here. And even the people coming from legacy, you know, they're, they're new to this framework we're working within. So leaders need to be able to, to come in and be supportive. And we also need to support leaders in these companies and organizations, understanding a lot of them are new. A lot of them are, are learning the ropes of, of management, whether that management in cannabis or management in general. And so how do we as companies and, and again, as us as recruiters, bring in the right talent to actually lead? Because the paper, you know, resume is easy to have, but we really need strong leaders because our industry desperately needs support. Um, and that needs to come, you know, kind of from the top down. And so we're really excited to work on some of those roles and and bring in like strong leaders who are excited to really come in and help manage the people and manage the processes and really get things moving forward. One thing that I uh, that I think is really interesting about Canvas overall is how much you can have industry by design. So uh, you know, because it's a new like a new industry that's just uh, you know coming from nowhere in many respects. Obviously, off the black market, but. Uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, industry by design. At the same time, uh, we have the rise of artificial intelligence, uh, which I'm curious about your take on that as well, and how that may be impacting your recruitment. Uh, so, how? So, I guess uh, uh, from an industry by design standpoint, you see a lot of fractionalization. There's, you know, fractional, even fractional attorneys, fractional uh, CFOs. HR, uh, you know, the full gamut. How is that impacting recruitment? And also how is AI impacting recruitment? So if you can. Mm -hmm. Well, I love, I love fractions. So uh, yeah. anyone who's talked to me long enough knows that I'm obsessed with the fractional model. We are going to be rolling out our own fractional HR program um, in the coming weeks and months. So stay tuned. But really, again, after six years of being in the industry and, and, and again, as recruiters, people are always like, oh yeah, you're just, you're not just recruiters, but you're recruiters. It's like, no, but we hear everyone else's stories all day long. Like, my job is to sit on the phone eight hours a day and hear the stories of the people who are on the ground building the industry. So all of the wisdom that I have isn't necessarily necessarily even close to mine. It's just everyone else's and I just get to, to share it back out. So in terms of the fractional model, you know, one of the things is the industry itself and what we've seen after, you know, some of these more mature markets or we have five to 10 years of data is, you know, the industry needs to be built. As you said, we're building it, right? So when there's a mindset, it's kind of that book, you know, zero to one. It's like that idea that like the people that build things or, or processes or, or visions out of nothing are a very unique skill set. And that's why I love this industry because again, there's so many builders and innovators and creators. And it's like really amazing to talk to those people. But once the machine is built, they're not the ones who are meant to like run the machine. Like that's not their brains. So either they get bored and I've had people call me and be like, I just built the most amazing sales team and the systems are great and everything's perfect and I'm bored. I'm going to break it. I need out. <laughs> I was like, okay, we'll get you out. Don't break it. You did a really good job. So oh, yeah. you know, you either have the candidate side that's like, okay, I want my new challenge, my next thing. Or you have the business that's like, well, we don't want to pay this person all this money who built the system because we don't really need that person anymore. We can have someone who's more junior step into the role um, and maybe refine it and optimize it. But like, we don't necessarily need that, that greater mindset. So it's created this sort of shift and change. And so I think fractional is a great solution to that in terms of addressing the iterations that we're going to have as a, as a building industry, right? So um, I think that really allows companies, especially, you know, if you're looking at fractional CFOs or fractional COOs or even CEO's best friend, I know CEO fractionals are a little hard, but I've, I've heard it called, you know, yeah, the best friend of a CEO. But they can really come in at the right time with the right strategic vision and the right sort of knowledge and really like unlock like a video game, unlock that next level, right? Like they're like the right kick, right kick punch. Like you're like, yeah, that's the combo I need. Like, come on in, right? Like it's literally like <laughs> like Mario games from the or uh, Mortal Kombat from the from the eighties. Yeah. I'm aging myself, right? 
Yeah, I'm aging myself here. But uh, but yeah, so I think that that's what, what a lot of it is. And there is a little bit of resistance. And I, I think, you know, right now, consultants have kind of got a dirty word and, or become a dirty word in our industry because there are a lot of people who claim to be consultants and, and don't necessarily have that expertise. Um, and so I think fractional, there's a bit of a dance right now where a lot of people from consulting is, are flipping their titles into fractional, which I think is important, but they have to remember. And people ask me often like, hey, what's Steph, like what's the difference between a consultant and a fractional? And for me, like I learned about fractional CFOs back in 2009 on Bay Street, which is you know Wall Street in Toronto. By I met somebody who was working as a CFO, a fractional CFO, amongst startups. And his whole thing was, you know, he worked for a fortune 100 company and he didn't, he made a lot of money, but wasn't happy. And he loved working with startups, didn't make the money, uh, but was happy. And so how do we figure this out? So he was talking about that and, you know, talking about the diverse, how do you sort of diversify, um, you know, the, the clients that you're working with, but really be able to be a much more embedded and, and hands-on, you know, leader versus a consultant that I think comes in, does a project and leaves. And they're not looking at like the holistic nature of the business and really looking at it from a 360 perspective. We're me fractional leadership are really embedded and are actually like a supportive leader sitting around the table with the other leaders of the company who are aren't fractional or might also be fractional so it's a much more embedded supportive long-term strategic lens um and for us you know we want to really make sure that we're providing an actual human who's going to be helping you know the hr function not just a hotline or a, an administrative person on the back end just typing something to a computer like we really want to have that hands-on support that's leading the company through that phase of its people part uh, and be able to then understand where that transitions in the future. Fantastic. So the, any, are you seeing any uh, influence of artificial intelligence on, on what you're doing? Uh, are, are we say uh, you're not going to get replaced by artificial intelligence. You'll get replaced by somebody who has mastered artificial intelligence as a tool. So uh, I don't know if you see it the same way or. Uh, if yeah. You're, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and then thank you for the reminder on that one. So, you know, you see a lot of like, oh, all these AI, you know, job job postings and, and how are the, all these articles about, oh, the, the people don't even read resumes anymore and no one can get through the applicant tracking systems and the, the keyword search. Like I... I started in the government, like the government back even 10, 15 years ago was infamous for using keyword searches. So like, this is not new to me to have to have your resume on the keywords. But I think there is certain companies leaning into AI more as a recruitment firm, of course, like I'm always looking at how I can optimize my systems and processes. That's one of the reasons I didn't fit in at the government. Cause I was like, can we do this a little different, a little more optimized? And they were like, no, this is what we do. And I was like, ah, oh, yeah, like, done it. <laughs> I can't do it. I can't, I can't come in at eight 30 every day. What if I want to come in at nine 30? Right. <laughs> Cause it's like, ah. um, but with AI, you know, as a recruiter, like I just, I think it's an amazing tool. Like we, we do use AI on the back end. It does make our systems and processes easier. It allows me to have more human interaction. Like an example is we have, I have an automatic note taker that I bring into calls, just like a lot of people use note takers now for meetings, but ours is specifically for recruiting. And I was hesitant to get it because I, you know, during my conversations, I typed notes. And in my mind, that was making me very engaged. But once I started using the AI and I didn't have to necessarily take time being stuck on like, what was that figure and who was that person's name? And what was that company's name? Now that I can just kind of like type high level notes and know that the note taker is capturing all that information, if I need to, and when I need to reference it later, allows me much more engaged with my clients and much more engaged with my candidates. So I can actually have the conversation and let us be human to human and then let the robots take care of some of the details. So I, I do really enjoy it. We'll continue to use a lot of AI at Emerald Lane. That's also the way that we can now offer, you know, services that are at a rate that match the industry is we're looking at automation tools and kind of optimizing our system. So it seems to be this dance. If you look at, um, you know, what's coming down the pipeline last year, I was at Green Tech in Amsterdam. You know, it's the biggest uh, agriculture show and horticulture show in the world. And there was all these robots and robots that pick strawberries and they can just like laser know what strawberry to pick. Like there's some stuff, really interesting stuff coming. So I do think the industry as a whole will be very impacted by AI. But if we can use it for good and if we can use it to optimize so that the humans can stay in their zones of genius and really do the human things, I think it can be this really beautiful dance will help the industry, especially when we have redu reduced budgets and, and headcount, et cetera. Great wisdom there, uh, for sure. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about uh, as we're, we're kind of running up against our time, but the, the buddy brunch uh, uh, and what that is, uh, if you tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, Buddy Brunch is something I started two and a half years ago. So um, it's, you know, the industry, there's tons of conferences, right? As you're saying, I'm on the road all the time. I, I'm all over the place, you know, just trying to get ready now for MJ BizCon end of the year. Everyone's all ready and flying in from all over the world. So, you know, conferences are a big part of the industry for a lot of us who are service providers. And so for me, you know, a lot of the events that are happening there, you know, they're great, they're social, but a lot of them are late at night. A lot of them are based around alcohol and uh, loud nightclubs. A lot of them are expensive to get into or invite only. Only, and I feel like exclusivity in our industry is is going to be our own, you know, our own demise. And so for me, I started something two and a half years ago called Buddy Brunch, where we started meeting for breakfast before a conference um, and sort of around conferences so that there were open invites to whoever was in the local area who worked in cannabis. Um, everyone was welcome around the breakfast table. We have a pay what you want model. So some people come in and have a, a coffee. Some people come in and, and buy breakfast for everyone. It just depends on the day. Um, and really people just sit down and actually have breakfast together. And so it's been this really uh, amazing you know, event. We just did one in Chicago. Um, in Chicago, we actually new, newly implemented a new a give forward program. So for everyone who came to our breakfast, even if they just stopped in and I had a people be like, I'm coming in for five minutes. Okay. Bye. And ran off. Um, but for anyone who came in, we donated meals to the Chicago food bank. Um, and we ended up donating 540 meals to feed local families. So it was such an exciting way to kind of give back while also people get to come and network. People's guards are down. It's not who, who is not cool. It's like, you just get to sit and actually eat healthy fuel food and fuel up for the day. So we've had a lot of success. We're doing a really big one. Um, in Vegas at Buddy Brunch, or sorry, at uh, MJ BizCon this year. We did one last year, and first year we had 100 people. Last year we had, again, around that number signed up. This year we're going to be even bigger. Uh, we'll be announcing a really exciting partnership for that and really bringing the global community together around the breakfast table. So, uh, And we'll do it a little bit later because it's Vegas, but uh, but yeah, Buddy Brunch is really something we're fun uh, having a lot of fun with. And we're really excited to have anyone welcome to join us. Um, and all that information you know, we announce, and, and we'd love to have people around the breakfast table. That's fantastic. I, it's always easier to really get to know somebody, obviously, uh, at a table with a meal, uh, as opposed to you know, those those uh, conferences are very large and uh, a lot of folks get lost in the shuffle. I think it's not it's not their jam, but I think, uh, you know, that's a great idea uh, anyway. So uh, what's your prognosticate a little bit? Where do you see, where are we heading in five years? Uh, uh, where do you think uh, what do you think where do you think the cannabis industry is going to be? We're growing. Like, I feel like we're still, we're growing up, right? Like, we're going to, I think there's two things we're going to go. We're going to grow up. Like, literally, I think we're going to mature a little bit as a market. I think companies are going to start to understand that their needs that, like, more the mature markets and, and, and depending on where you are. But, you know, that professionalizing of the industry, that really systems and structures and processes and bringing in those best practices from other industries that we've been a little bit resistant to, I think we really, that'll hopefully be coming together. And we can really recognize that if we want to play ball, if we want to be in a, a really recognized, um, standardized industry that's bringing the plant to as many people as we can. We all have to play together and we all have to you know, follow the rules in a sense, but also like bring in these best practices from other businesses so that we're not spending our time reinventing wheels just to come to the same conclusion, you know? So I think a lot of the sort of growing up, I also think the industry is going to keep growing. Like we're not going backwards. Like, you know, they're, they're, we're not going back in the, in, you know, the genie's not going back in the box. And so I think we're going to see more states coming online in the U.S., um, you know, we're going to have some sort of rescheduling, descheduling. I think they're going to have to eventually sort of realize that there's something going to happen. So there will be a shift in that. I think we're going to have more consumer access. Um, we're going to have all different types of products. You know, I'm really excited to see a more diverse product offering amongst just like high THC flour. Like that doesn't speak to a lot of the consumers from the general public. So how do we look at other, you know, beverages are a big thing right now. Topicals. I'm excited about cosmetics. Like there's so much advancement, like CBG for skincare and rosacea. And just like, I think we can use a lot of of uh, this medicine or this this product into more of those wellness categories. So how do we look at cannabis not as adult use and not as only or not only as adult use and only as medical, but how where is the wellness component in it? How do we sort of make sure that there's a conversation in the middle? Open up more product categories, um, more, more markets. You know, seeing the globalization, where else are we growing? And for us, like there's just going to be more and more people coming into the industry. So. 
you know, we're so exciting to be able to be able, so we are excited to be able to support these other markets in, in coming online and really bringing those best practices, bringing the best talent in the world into these new spaces, uh, bringing their knowledge, their wisdom, their expertise, their hard work to be able to empower like the next generation of cannabis companies to like circumvent. I was talking to somebody last week and he was an early person at one of the big pub co's. He was like, when I'm talking to companies and talking about my consulting services is like, I tell them like, you can learn from my $5 billion mistake. And they're like, okay, yeah. well, that, more that budget than we have, right? So anyone coming into the cannabis industry now, like not necessarily Canada, but look to learn from these mature markets, look to learn from the people that have been embedded in it, and also look to learn from the people that are new to it. It's fresh energy, it's fresh eyes, it's best practices, it's insight from other industries. So I think the more inclusive and the more welcoming we can be, you know, less of this infighting, less of this, you're not, you're not me, you're not medical, you're not wrecked. You're not legacy. You're not this note. Like all of us just like, let's come together because the world is watching us. And the more we can be cohesive and supportive of each other and really just focus on getting this plant to the people and really keeping that as our end goal, the better the industry is going to grow for all of us. And the more sustainable all of our work and all of the business we do is going to be. Fantastic. Two more questions. That's all I got. Uh, So (laughs) first off, uh, what advice would you give a cannabis company looking to attract uh, the best talent, and then on the same, uh, the opposite side of that, what? How would you advise a uh, somebody seeking to enter the industry to be able to get the the ideal position for themselves? Uh, I get asked all the time, "How do I get in? How do I get in?" Everybody's looking uh, for a way to get in. So I don't know if you can impart some wisdom uh, on those two questions. Absolutely, I'll start with the the company side of it. So for companies, I really think it's about understanding who you need why you need them, and then what are you going to do with them, right? So like, it's a, it's an idea of, you know, refining your, your systems and your processes, getting really clear on, you know, who you need to hire, how you need to hire them, when you need to hire them. And that's why, you know, it's like, well, I can just hire, I've hired people for whatever, like for, you know, that's why you have recruiters. That's why you have those of us who do HR advisory services and strategic planning, because we've been through this enough, right? You don't have to necessarily do it yourself, um, but really looking at how you're bringing people in, even like the way you develop your job descriptions, you know, making sure they're really clear, making sure the expectations are there on both sides, having a very clear interview process, making sure that the right stakeholders are around the table, making sure that you're having the right and real dialogues on all sides. Also remember, you know, reputation matters. So, you know, any of this sort of like cowboy behavior with hiring processes, people talk, people remember, and people know. And so making sure that when you bring somebody into an interview process, when you bring somebody into to your company or at the offer stage, even the way you post your jobs, people are watching and they want to work for companies they feel excited about and they're going to feel supported in. So making sure that that first impression is really, really um strong and really reflects your own company and and what you're like, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of grace and compassion. We are startups. And so owning a lot of that and then putting that human component back into it where companies can just say, Hey, like we're still learning, but we're still going to be, you know, we're going to commit to our half of the agreement and we want you to commit to your half of the agreement. So I think that that really having that sort of, um, circular, sort of dynamic relationship between the employer and the employee. Um, And if you're starting these companies, again, working with recruiters, like we've been doing this for a long time. This is our zone of genius, right? Like we, we can't grow plants. If you put me in a grow right now, like I kind of could tinker around a little bit from all the lessons I've learned from all the growers I've talked to over the years, but like that plant probably wouldn't last longer than a week for my black thumb would take over, but like, let us do the people part. You grow careers. That's what you do. You grow careers, right? Yeah, we grow careers. I can do that with people, but uh, black thumb when it comes to plants. But yeah, like yeah. lean into recruitment companies, right? And and companies like ours, we are aware of where the industry's at. So we have adapted our pricing. We are looking at how we can have alternative fee models, um, looking at how we can take the pricing and sort of reduce it a little bit to based on the clients and the market that we're at, do flat fee pricing, uh, bulk hiring rates even some of those sort of like RPO models. So we're really trying to match the market where it is so that they can use our services and that we can also support them while they stay in their zone of genius and build their companies. Um, so that's really on the, the company side. On the candidate side, well, yeah, it's, it is it can be a tricky industry to kind of fall into or get into um, depending on what area of the supply chain you're trying to get into. I tell people all the time, you know, cannabis is a really exciting industry to work in, but it also isn't for everybody. And I've been doing cannabis career coaching as well as I've gone through it because I had so many people, you know, starting six years ago, how do I do my cannabis resume? That's how even I got into it. I asked a recruiter how I put my legacy experience on my resume. So, you know, how do you, how do you sort of get into it? So I've done a lot of coaching and, and talking through that. You know, I tell a lot of people, this is a startup industry. It's 
it's really dynamic. It's not necessarily sort of like the most stable in, in many, many ways. And so if you want a job that's sort of stable and the processes are built and the systems are built and there's a lot of structure, like this probably isn't the right industry for you. Like you might find some companies here and there, depending on what part of the supply chain you're in. But if you're trying to be plant touching, if you're trying to work in any of the retail dispensaries or any of the processors, like there's a lot of that we're all still learning. So anyone who's in that sort of mindset to come in and, and be adaptive. The other thing I think I tell people all the time is, you know, tell your cannabis story, right? I have an intimate story where one of my office hours, I had a, a gentleman come in from the East Coast. His, ins- his resume just talked about being an insurance broker. It's like something that I couldn't really see a relevancy, obviously, unless he wanted to go in cannabis insurance. And he came on the phone, he was pretty dressed up and you know, I was thinking, okay, like, where is he going to fit in this industry? Let's have a conversation. And I asked him, like, why do you want to work in cannabis? Because that's what I ask all my candidates. And he immediately broke down in tears. And he told me the story about how his wife had been in an accident. And because and she, you know, all the pain medication, she ended up being unable to really function, take care of their family, be, be his partner. And she found cannabis. And now she's, you know, this healthy, vibrant woman that was able to to be his wife and his family and, and raise his children. And he was like, I will give everything for the rest of my life to that plant. And so when I came back to him, I said, but your resume doesn't tell me that. It doesn't tell me anything about it. So what I started doing is coaching people to sort of have even like a little one liner in their resume, depending on their comfort level. You know, a lot of people are hobby growers or their family wasn't involved in cannabis or you know, there's different stories and there's different ways people feel comfortable sharing those stories. And it always has to be at their comfort level. But I tell people, like, if you have a personal why about cannabis and your resume doesn't say anything about cannabis and you, you know, how do you have a line or two that lets the reader know that you have a personal story so that we can get that interview and then tell the longer, deeper story. So I really think being able to adapt identify that. Again, there's always events. I tell people show up at events, right? There's always pop-ups and dispensary openings and brand launches and different conferences, different price points, different consumer shows. So just go get curious, walk around, talk to people. You never know who you're going to meet. And you might go and spend 25 bucks on a ticket and walk out and be like, I'm definitely never working in cannabis. And that's okay. That'll save you a lot of time. And now you know. Right. Like now, you know, um, but, you know, give it some chances, show up, get to know people, have conversations, you know, our industry, LinkedIn, like there's a lot of ways to learn about the industry to start to listen along. There's a lot of webinars, there's a lot of podcasts, like you can become an informed consumer or a cons- a, an, an informed employee before you even get in the industry and learning those things and then come in and start the dialogue. And you already have sort of a starting foundation to add to the, to the conversation. So there's a lot of opportunity in cannabis um, for those who are willing to sort of adapt, understand the startup industry you know, with salaries aren't matched by a lot of these large industries and large companies. We're still new here. We're still figuring out revenue. And if you can have compassion and understanding to that and you and, and your family and, and the way that your life is set up can actually adapt to that, then yeah, there's a lot of possibility here. And if it's not okay right now, then it's also not okay. I tell people they can always go and they can always come back. So there's really going to be a, a long-term opportunity for anyone who wants to get into it uh, to have a career in cannabis. And sort of, I think there's endless possibilities in terms of what's possible. Fantastic. I, I love your point. Basically, uh, finding your cannabis why, you know, and articulating that uh, in a resume, because uh, it seems that that kind of authenticity is uh, at least the my clients and other folks I've uh, interacted with in the industry, that authenticity really matters, uh, because there is a huge advocacy piece to it. And there are a lot of uh, pitfalls. And, uh, you know, the night is dark and full of terrors, right? So, um uh, particularly in this industry and we need the government to take action. And, uh, so it's, you know, huge part of it. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And thank you for, uh, I don't believe that you're an introvert. That's for sure. Uh, my social energy is, that's my social <laughs> energy and drive, like mic drop. So it's, uh, it's no, but it's, uh, I, I, it's been a fun conversation. So I do, I appreciate you having me on here. I appreciate you being on. We're going to have to do part two and uh, we are go-to uh, eyes and ears as it relates to what's going on all around the world. So uh, thank you again for having, uh, or for being on the uh, video cast here. Thank you to the Global Cannabis Times for allowing us to do this. And, you know, feel free to reach out to me or Stephanie uh, about the cannabis industry. We'd be happy to help. So with that being said, thank you and have a good rest of your day. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.